This series of lessons contains graphic descriptions and depictions of violence, sexual violence, sexually explicit language, and offensive and dehumanizing language which may be disturbing and may not be suitable for minors or other audiences. It is intended for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for, nor does it replace, professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment of mental health conditions. For this lesson, we'll meet a classic lust killer. He claimed he wasn't, but his behavior shows otherwise. This case involved another attempt at a behavioral profile, like what we saw in Bache's case. But this killer's pattern proved challenging in a different way. His motive, too, was quite rare. This makes him an excellent example to demonstrate to students of profiling how unique these offenders can be. The definitive source for details is Carl Berg's book, The Sadist. On a frigid February morning in 1929, men going to work in the Flingern district of Dusseldorf, Germany, spotted something under a hedge. They went closer to see it and smelled a strong odor of petroleum. Its source was the corpse of a girl who'd been set on fire. The police transported the victim for an autopsy. Dr. Carl Berg, the medical director of the Dusseldorf Institute of Legal and Social Medicine, performed it. The girl's hair was charred and she'd been stabbed multiple times. Oddly, the wounds were shaped like scissor blades. Berg noticed blood stains on her underwear and found seminal fluid. Since the victim hadn't been raped, Berg thought the killer had used his finger to push semen against her vagina. This suggested he was impotent. Investigators identified the victim as Rosa Oliger. She was eight years old. Her wounds were the same shape as those on a woman who'd been stabbed six days prior but had survived. This victim said a man had greeted her before he grabbed the lapels of her coat and warned her not to scream. He'd stabbed her over and over two dozen times. She did scream, scaring him off, but could not offer a good description. She only recalled his manner. Soon after Oliger's murder, an intoxicated man leaving a bar at midnight was fatally stabbed. His 20 gashes looked like the scissor blade wounds. No arrest was made. Given the different types of victims, the police saw no connection among the incidents. Berg disagreed. He expected more attacks, so he made an inventory of items for comparison. He found that each incident had involved a quick blitz approach, the same type of weapon, and the same frenzied stabbing. They'd occurred in the same isolated area after dark. Each victim had been stabbed or hit at least once in the temple but this list did not help to identify a suspect. The attacks did continue. The following month, two women survived stabbings and a few months later, during a single evening, three women had each sustained a single stab wound. This time, the Dusseldorf stabber had used a sharp knife. Even with the change in weapon, Berg still thought it was the same person. The town generally did not see this type of violence. Having two such attackers at the same time would have been highly unusual. The worst attacks were yet to come. Two foster sisters, ages 5 and 14, disappeared on their way home from a market. Searchers discovered their bodies in a garden close to a public path. They'd been strangled and their throats were cut. The youngest child had bled from a severed artery while the older one had four stab wounds to her back. Later that same day, a man attacked a young woman. She was saved from a frenzy stabbing only when others rescued her.
She described her attacker as a blonde, blue-eyed man in his mid-30s. He'd flirted with her before stabbing her so ferociously that he broke his knife, leaving the tip in her back. He'd said, now you shall die. Berg examined the knife tip and confirmed that the man had used a dagger. This woman's wounds were like the most recent assaults. Strangely enough, this was just one more case of unique serial brutality in Germany during the past decade. Just after Germany's defeat in World War I, the new Weimar Republic saw an increase in deviant killers. From 1918 until 1921, Georg Karl Grossmann killed more than two dozen women in Berlin and sold their flesh in the black market. During the same period, Karl Denke, the mass murderer of Münsterberg, killed travelers and homeless people. He kept detailed records and poured buckets of their blood in his open courtyard. After his arrest in 1924, he claimed he'd consumed parts from as many as 31 people. In Hanover, butcher Fritz Harman teamed up with a male sex worker to lure at least two dozen young men into a game of terminal sex. After he killed them, Harmon would consume pieces of their flesh and sell the rest to his customers as regular meat. Cultural psychologists have interpreted this rare cluster of bloodlust and cannibalism as a manifestation of social tension after Germany's humiliating defeat. They thought these killers had subconsciously absorbed the collective desire to reassert power. Their raw brutality might have signaled conditions that would support the rise of Hitler and another world war. Berg was aware of these other offenders, although no one yet knew much about the psychology of serial murder. He would soon be among those rare experts. On September 30th, 1929, the body of Ida Reuter was discovered. She'd been raped and sexually posed with a circle of wounds around the crown of her head. The weapon seemed to have been a hammer. The differences in approach, victim type, and weapon type among these victims puzzled Berg, but he still believed they had a single offender. Within a month, two other women were similarly assaulted. Berg also learned about a spate of hammer attacks over the past three years on women in a town 50 miles away. All had survived. But a hammer was an odd weapon for assault. November brought a letter to the local newspaper offering directions to the body of a five-year-old girl that the police had already found. She'd been strangled, mutilated, and stabbed 36 times with wounds to her head. The same letter described the location of the grave of Maria Hahn, who'd been missing for several months. Her strangled body showed bruises and stab wounds. Three punctures in the left temple and seven parallel stabs to the neck resembled the scissor blade wounds. The killer seemed to be using his original weapon. The Dusseldorf crimes had gained national attention, so Detective Chief Inspector Ernst Gennat got involved. He was director of Berlin's criminal police force and one of the most successful crime fighters in the country. He headed a task force to find and arrest the Dusseldorf killer. Later, Gennat would be the first to use the phrase Syrian murder or serial murder when he wrote about this series of slayings for publication. Berg thought the killer's apparent desire for publicity, with its inherent risks, indicated he was losing control. But no similar incidents happened over the winter. It seemed possible he died or left town. That is, until May 1930. A woman who'd been sexually assaulted took Chief Inspector Gennat to where her rapist lived. The perpetrators saw them approach and ran to tell his wife he'd soon be arrested. Then he fled. 
His wife helped police to arrest him. His name was Peter Curtin. He was 46. He readily confessed to a multitude of crimes from rape to arson to murder. He even described incidents in which he hadn't been suspected, culminating in 79 different crimes. He was charged with nine murders and seven attempted murders. Psychiatrists interviewed him and offered a variety of conflicting diagnoses. Defense psychiatrists believed Curtin was sexually insane, but he claimed he could master his urge and knew that what he'd done was wrong. As he awaited his trial, he expressed hope for a finding of manslaughter or an acquittal due to lack of responsibility. Berg agreed that lust had compelled Curtin, but thought it hadn't deprived him of control. He'd used false names so he'd known there were legal consequences, and sometimes he'd avoided the danger of discovery by going home unsatisfied. In the courtroom when his wife was present, Curtin changed his tune. He said he'd made it all up based on details from newspapers. He was just looking for attention. However, he'd offer accurate details in the Han incident that newspapers had not reported. The jury also heard from survivors who'd identified Curtin and from investigators who corroborated the crime details. The jurors convicted Curtin on all charges. As Curtin awaited execution, Berg saw an opportunity to study a rare type of criminal who was sexually aroused by his victim's blood. Berg visited Curtin and requested his cooperation. Curtin liked the idea of contributing to science. Deviant sexual desires have been organized into psychiatric categories known as paraphilias or intense abnormal urges that focus on objects, situations, or activities for sexual gratification. The fifth and current edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders lists these conditions and offers criteria. However, this list is not exhaustive. Sexologists and criminologists acknowledge that there are many more. In fact, one expert lists more than 500 paraphilias. They're considered psychosexual disorders and most are not criminal acts. However, they can fuel fantasies that trigger predatory criminal behavior. Paraphilias are primarily, but not exclusively, male disorders. Many begin during childhood or adolescence and persist into adulthood. They often derive from what any given society views as abnormal for sexual gratification. This can differ from one culture to another. Only those paraphilias that involve non-consenting partners, including animals, with resulting harm or destruction of property are criminal acts. The types of images in these fantasies influence the victim type, approach, preferred activities, rituals, and decisions to complete the act or not with murder. Berg gathered as much information as he could. He learned that Curtin was born on May 26, 1883, into a family of 11 children. They crowded into a one-bedroom apartment. His father was a violent man who abused alcohol, so Curtin had witnessed him repeatedly beating his wife and kids. This gave Curtin a role model for violence and for how to treat a woman. In addition, the father used up the family's meager resources on alcohol. Only when he was arrested for sexually assaulting his 13-year-old daughter did police remove him from the home. Curtin experienced an early impulse to kill. He told Berg that when he was nine, he was playing with other boys on a raft 
One boy fell off and Curtin surreptitiously pushed him under, drowning him. On another occasion, he pushed a boy off the raft to let the current carry him away. Both times, Curtin knew he'd done something wrong, but felt only pleasure. Thereafter, he cultivated the ability to seem normal while hiding his secret perversions. In school, Curtin had been a good student and gave his teachers no trouble. Outside of school was a different story. Around the same time that he killed his playmates, Curtin befriended a dog catcher who lived in his building. The man liked to torture animals. He invited the boy into this activity with him. As they watched dogs writhe in pain, they masturbated together. Curtin then visited farms to look for larger animals to rape. Often he stabbed them at the same time to draw blood. He was 13 when he first experienced an orgasm. It happened while he stabbed an animal. Yet when he tired of raping animals, he knew his lust was only about the blood, the way it rushed out. He craved the sight and sound of it. He told Berg, it is the blood that is decisive in most of the cases. Throttling alone is insufficient. He described how the combination of struggle and blood became necessary for arousal. This process, which applies to many lust killers, is known as orgasmic conditioning. A team of psychologists proposed this concept in 1965 when they studied the relationship between masturbation and deviant sexuality. They surmised that whatever was associated with an orgasm, whether an image or an object, the stimulation would be physiologically recorded. The more regularly this sexual stimulation occurred with the same image or object, the more forceful the object or image became as an erotic trigger. If acted out, it could become compulsive. If the person lacked social bonding that supports moral behavior, the isolation could allow more indulgence without shame. Such individuals then developed cravings for that same experience, which fed an addiction. If the experience was as good as expected or better, the brain's reward mechanism ensured more of the same behavior. Social constraints would fail to contain it. Using this model, we can see how killers like Curtin developed. Violence, force, stabbing, and blood became part of his arousal mechanism. The more pleasure he found in it, the more he sought it, eventually making this combination necessary for arousal. He said he'd once witnessed a man fall under a train and he pretended to help just to get near the blood. At age 16, Curtin was ready to move on from animals to humans. One day, he went for a walk with a teenage girl. On impulse, he throttled her until she passed out. He believed she was dead, so he fled the scene. He never discovered if he'd killed her. In the second such incident, the victim survived and reported him. She recalled him saying, that's what love's like. Apparently, his father's sexual aggression had left an impression. Whenever Curtin was caught for petty crimes like theft, he went to prison. He found it intolerable and developed a deep sense of resentment against society. After serving one four-year stint, Curtin set several local bars on fire. He masturbated while he watched, imagining people inside shriveling up. He supported himself with thefts and burglaries, which earned him more prison time. Around age 30 in 1913, Curtin acted on his desire for human blood. He needed money, so he crept into the second floor room of an inn to steal whatever he could find. He spotted a young girl asleep in bed under a quilt. 
He stepped over to her and watched. She remained asleep. He grew aroused. Reaching down, Curtin pulled off the quilt and strangled her, holding her by the throat as she struggled. This was what he'd fantasized about during his years in prison. When she passed out, he penetrated her genitals with his fingers and used a pocket knife to slice her throat. Her blood spurted, so he leaned to catch it in his mouth. Just then, he ejaculated. He'd found the experience intoxicating. As the girl died, he fled. But he did not forget his sense of satisfaction. In 1921, Kurt met a former sex worker who'd served time in prison for killing a man who'd betrayed her. They later married and moved to Dusseldorf. Curtin grew restless. When his wife went to work, he'd often roam the streets to find a victim. On February 8, 1929, Curtin killed eight-year-old Rosa Oliger. Berg was now in familiar territory. He'd done the autopsies. Using his charts, he asked Curtin his most pressing questions about the murders. Some answers confirmed what he'd surmised. Others surprised him. As he listened, he formed an opinion as to what kind of man Curtin was. Curtin said that he'd often searched for a victim for hours, yet remained aware of the need to be home before his wife returned. He kept his nocturnal prowls a secret. Berg viewed the murder of Maria Hahn as the one that offered the best insight into Curtin's personality and motivation. Curtin had spent time with her like they were on a date and then had strangled her into unconsciousness. She'd revived and he'd strangled her again before stabbing her in the throat to drink blood from the wound. She'd remained alive and aware of his intent, begging for her life. It had taken her about an hour to die. Despite Curtin claiming he was not a lust murderer, Berg thought his goal was always arousal and climax. After Han had finally expired, he'd rolled her into a ditch, covered her with twigs, and stole her handbag. When he'd worried that the body might be found and associated with him, he'd return to bury it more deeply. Feeling sentimental, he'd caressed the corpse's hair. He tried to hang it from a tree to get some sensational news coverage, but hadn't managed it. Instead, he'd buried her. A few months later, he'd sent authorities directions to the grave. Burke probed the way Curtin had chosen different types of victims. Curtin admitted he was attempting to deflect the investigation by making it appear that there were several killers. He was also experimenting with weapons. At one point, he changed from scissors to a dagger because the scissors weren't efficient. He'd also tried a chisel and a hammer, but the hammer broke. He'd returned to scissors, which he'd used on the five-year-old child because this was the least conspicuous weapon to carry. Curtin had read murder stories in the news because they were titillating. He'd pick out violent films as well, especially when killers gripped victims by the neck, and he'd studied the case of Jack the Ripper. Everything he did was in service to his lust for blood and the arousal it produced. Berg decided that Curtin was a depraved megalomaniac and a sadistic psychopath. Curtin would have continued to kill had he not been stopped. He'd been born with a predisposition for deviation, and his early experiences had conditioned him toward abnormality. Prison time had provided the opportunity to nurture his fantasy life. Once free, he'd acted out. Former FBI profiler Robert Hazelwood studied how sexual sadism often starts with a detailed, persistent fantasy like Curtin's. 
As Hazelwood once stated to me, we see that crime originates in the mind and all of the senses are employed. The sense of taste, touch, smell, feel, and sight. If the senses approve it, the offender will proceed. Then he considers the consequences. To some, that makes no difference. So he goes on to the next step. I'm going to do it. And then we have step five. The mind rationalizes the behavior. Hazel would describe sexual sadists as super predators. They are the great white sharks of deviant crime, marked by their wildly complex fantasy worlds, unequaled criminal cunning, paranoia, insatiable sexual hunger, and enormous capacity for destruction. Berg estimated that Curtin's disorder was 90% sadism and 10% a desire for revenge for perceived injustices. He even confessed to a touch of masochism as he tried to get women to slap him. He blamed multiple factors for his criminal acts, from his family life growing up to his terrible treatment in prison. However, it was clear that he developed into a thrill killer. Each time he described an incident, he focused not on punishment, but on sexual gratification. Curtin often envisioned enacting a mass murder, he said, mostly to arouse a public reaction. He loved the press coverage. That was why he sent them to Maria Hahn's grave. Sometimes he returned to undiscovered bodies to relive the experience. He also visited his victims' graves repeatedly, digging his fingers into the dirt to renew his excitement. Curtin appeared to possess no moral restraints. Berg learned that Curtin's family history included numerous thieves and alcoholics. His father had been a rapist and two of his brothers had also gone to prison. However, there was no evidence of hereditary mental illness. He'd sustained a head wound in 1922 when a piece of iron hit him. But his crimes had started long before this incident, and he'd shown no sudden personality change afterward. Curtin was just depraved. Berg heard prison officials describe Curtin as quick to assess any situation and use it to his advantage. He was a talented chameleon who knew how to win people over. He might well be telling Berg lies or exaggerating just to keep the doctor's attention. Berg saw that Curtin felt entitled to more than he'd received from life. Yet beneath the arrogance, he suffered from low self-esteem over his small penis. To a surviving victim, he'd said his tail was barely there. Just before his execution, Curtin saw a confessor and wrote letters to the relatives of his murder victims to ask for pardon. He said he understood that his crimes were ghastly and he did not challenge the death penalty. He claimed to feel sorry for the relatives and he hoped to be forgiven. The next morning on July 2nd, 1931, he was executed. Peter Curtin's response to a deviant role model that made his grim childhood bearable demonstrates how exposure to certain influences at impressionable ages can result in aberrant disorders. His father had abused and raped his mother and sisters. The next role model, the dog catcher, had shown him how to get off by torturing animals. Curtin had adapted all of this to his own style by strangling girls. He developed a sexual thrill at the sight of spurting blood. So he'd attacked people with various implements from daggers to hammers to make them bleed. Berg's detailed study of this killer, Der Sadist, became a classic criminology text during the 1940s. Going beyond mere case analysis, 
Burp demonstrated to other professionals some key psychological details in the development of extreme sexual cruelty. I've found it to be one of the best books about a sadistic lust killer ever published. Sadism covers all acts that inflict harm on others for sexual gratification. Pleasure can derive from inflicting pain or watching others do it, whether to animals or human beings. The pain can be physical or psychological, as with suffering from extreme humiliation. The name derives from the cruel practices of the Marquis de Sade in France, who fictionally depicted scenes of vicious sexual violence. Sadism often pairs with masochism or sexual gratification from submitting to the infliction of pain. During the 1870s, Richard von Kraft Ebbing, director of the Feldhof Asylum in Austria, undertook the task of making the diagnosis of mental disorders scientific. His principal work is Psychopathia Sexualis, published in 1886. He added cases to subsequent editions until he'd included 238. He coined the terms sadism and masochism for professional use. He said that under pathological conditions, sadism could express itself as an impulse to subdue and dominate others, even to harm or kill them. The concept evolved with more research. Sigmund Freud, founder of psychoanalysis, recognized sadomasochism as a disorder that arises from repression of subconscious forces. He thought that males tend to be sadistic while women are generally masochistic. British psychologist Havelock Ellis denied such gender distinctions. He argued that the two conditions are complementary emotional states found in both sexes. Like most psychiatrists who practiced during the early 20th century, Berg was thoroughly acquainted with Kraft Ebbing's work. However, the case histories in Kraft Ebbing's book were brief compared to Berg's extended narrative on Peter Curtin. His research was groundbreaking, as was the amount of time he spent face to face talking with the killer. Today, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, places sadism and masochism on the list of paraphilias. Sadism often accompanies lust murderer or erotophonophilia. This is one of the most extreme forms of paraphilic behavior in which the offender is aroused by both the act and fact of murder. Lust killers typically seek the same type of victim because certain physical characteristics are necessary for arousal. The sadistic lust killer's goal is to make victims suffer prior to killing them. This includes biting, stabbing, asphyxiation, whipping, psychological torment, and even drinking their own blood in front of them. They might also mutilate the body post-mortem with dismemberment, cannibalism, stabbing, or biting. They typically have above average intelligence and adopt a solitary existence, even if married. Fantasy plays a strong role both before and after a murder. They usually plan the murder, devise a murder kit, and move the bodies to avoid discovery. Often the anger they direct at victims is actually aimed at a primary caretaker, usually the mother. The victim is a stand-in. Like with Vache, Curtin's life demonstrates how a lack of remorse, coupled with narcissism and the need for violence during arousal, encourages the conditions for serial sexual murder. But sexual stimulation is not the only motive for serial murder. 
Our next two killers, both female, had other reasons to kill and then kill again. Thank you.